I'm Corporal Christiana Halsey. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, sailors give the military's new health care system a big thumbs up. West Coast sailors and Marines conduct deployment training together, and March Madness sweeps the fleet. Join me and Petty Officer Clint Robertson for these stories and more on Navy Marine Corps News. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, sailors give the military's new health care system a big thumbs up. West Coast sailors and Marines conduct deployment training together, and March Madness sweeps the fleet. Stay tuned for these stories and more next on Navy Marine Corps News. Welcome to Navy Marine Corps News. I'm Corporal Christiana Halsey. And I'm Petty Officer Clint Robertson. Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie is out this week. I understand that U.S. Marines are getting a new commandant this summer. That's right. Secretary of the Navy John Dalton has nominated Lieutenant General Charles Krulak for promotion to general and to become the next commandant of the Marine Corps. President Bill Clinton has accepted that nomination and has forwarded it to the Senate. And following that Senate confirmation this spring and the retirement of General Carl Mundy on July 1st, General Krulak will become the 31st Commandant and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Krulak currently serves as Commander, U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific and Commanding General, Fleet Marine Force Pacific, headquartered in Camp Smith, Hawaii. Well, next to promotions and pay raises, medical care is one of the most important benefits to sailors and Marines. Last year's debate on national health care had many of us wondering about the future of our own health care. But we don't have to wonder anymore. TRICARE, the new health care initiative from the Department of Defense, is underway in both San Diego and Norfolk. And just how do service members and their families feel about it? Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie tells us. YN3 Shoner Mal Brew likes the TRICARE health care system because now his little boy gets to see the same doctor on every visit. And those visits only cost Malbrew $5. Lieutenant Steve Von Kalko used TRICARE to find a doctor closer to home for his pregnant wife. Hi, is my prescription ready? Okay, can I see ID, sir? Tom Lesher, yeah. And retired Master Chief Tom Lesher appreciates not having to spend hours pressing the redial button on his phone when he's trying to make a doctor's appointment at a military medical facility. They're like thousands of people in the Navy who've used TRICARE and think it works. TRICARE is way ahead of what uh, Champus ever was. I like the TRICARE Prime better than I like the old Champus because it's, it's more convenient. TRICARE hasn't replaced Champus though. Champus is a part of the TRICARE program. Basically, the new health care plan gives you three choices. TRICARE Prime, TRICARE Standard, and TRICARE Extra. Compared to Champus, TRICARE Prime will save families around $200 a year. Families will have to enroll in the program for a year, but there's no enrollment fee for active duty, no deductible, and no cost sharing. You'll pay just six to twelve dollars for routine doctor visits, and of course, military medical facilities are still free. Tricare Standard will be like Champus. There's a yearly deductible of one hundred fifty or three hundred dollars, and you have to pay twenty percent of the allowable cost of the care. Standard Champus is, like I said, is really good if you have your own health insurance. You don't go to the doctor very often or, you know, you travel a lot. TRICARE Extra lets you use either Champus or a doctor in the TRICARE Prime network. And with TRICARE Extra, you don't have to enroll to use it. Good morning, TRICARE Service Center. This is Ms. Parnell. How may I help you? One reason TRICARE works is all the health care resources in a region are managed from a central appointments office. You call one office and they can refer you to a military or civilian treatment center, one-stop shopping at its best. Prior to TRICARE, when you wanted to call for a, a military appointment, you had to call several appointments here at the hospital. Well, everybody was trying to call at the same time. And if you were lucky enough to get through after ringing, if you had, you need to have redial on your phone because otherwise you're just sitting there punching numbers for, for an hour, hour and a half. Since TRICARE has come into being, that kind of frustration has decreased remarkably well. Military health care specialists also see advantages in the new system. It allows us to become more familiar with our patients rather than just seeing patients in and out and you don't really get any familiarity with them. And your kid could just see one doctor instead of going to different doctors where they, you know, lose track of a certain kid. For people like YN3 Malbrew, oh, Lieutenant Von Kolko, and Tom Lesher, TRICARE is the answer to their health care needs. More choices with less weight for less money. 
Thanks to Chief Petty Officer Herb Josie for providing that report. Now remember, TRICARE is not online across the country yet, but plans are to have the new health care system in place nationwide by 1997. The system is currently operating in San Diego, Norfolk, Oregon, and Washington State. Now if you have any questions about TRICARE or would like more information, call your health benefits advisor. And increasing benefits is also something the Navy Department's top leadership recently brought up before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Discussing the Navy's budget for 1996, Secretary of the Navy John Dalton, the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps gave Senators an idea of the military's needs. Petty Officer Bill Miles has a story. The highest ranking people in the Department of the Navy sat before the Senate Armed Services Committee and addressed key military issues. We remain focused on key continuing priorities, our people, our technology, and our efficiency. We recognize that people are key to readiness, and we are committed to maintaining a proper balance between time deployed and time at home. And that time at home will be spent in better housing. Included in the proposed budget are initiatives to enhance quality of life, especially in the area of family housing, where the funding has been greatly increased. Money has also been set aside to maintain our stealth and superiority under the sea. The Russians have subs out there now that our subs cannot detect. At, at tactical speeds, the Akula is quieter than the 688 and is very difficult for us to detect. Our people are better, uh, and that's why we do adequately, and I would say adequately. While the, the threat is not there, the capability is, and intent can change rapidly. Uh, there are six Russian uh, improved Akulas that are a match, a be better than a match for our 688 eyes. They will not be a match for the Sea Wolf, nor will they be a match for the new attack submarine. Besides submarines, the CNO also said the Navy was looking at plans for a stealth fighter that can land on aircraft carriers. It's computer designs and charts at this time, it's not any metal, but it's pretty impressive. The Commandant of the Marine Corps was also asked about weapons, special weapons carried recently in Somalia. Such things as bean bags that will, you know, as you, when you shoot it, it's a little thing just like a bean bag that will hit you and will deter you or perhaps even stun you, but doesn't, you know, doesn't inflict a mortal wound and other types of sticky foam, those sorts of things that made the news. So, so it provides rocks. another option. It's not yes, you sir. sending a bunch of Marines in there with uh, foam and uh, bean bags. It's, no, it, sir. It's, we took no Nerf balls or anything like that. This was, <laughs> I mean, they were prepared to shoot if they had to, but, uh, but they could also deter a crowd through other means. These weapons are needed, but it takes people to get the job done. Our nation can be immensely proud of the professionalism, integrity, and daily dedication display, displayed by the men and women of the Navy and the Marine Corps. Two services, but one team. The For Navy and Marine Corps News, I'm Petty year. Officer Bill Miles. In addition when we return, sailors and Marines train together to stay ready for deployments. And Marines visit Iwo Jima to reflect and re-enlist. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Ann Gillian. To me, a person who is sober is in control and smart enough to be the designated driver. Because if we drink and drive, someone is going to get hurt. Or maybe even killed. And life is too precious to waste. The more you know, the more you realize that the person who drinks and drives is a loser. But the person who doesn't can take me home anytime. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. For sailors and Marines, preparing for deployment usually means training in separate areas for separate missions. That's true. Sailors go to sea for exercises with other ships in their battle group. And Marines head out to the field to practice maneuvers they'll use while deployed aboard amphibious ships. Now sailors and Marines who deploy together also train together. Petty Officer Diane Jacobs reports. Sailors and Marines train for combat all the time. And now that carrier battle groups and amphibious ready groups are working closer together in the fleet, it seems natural they should train together too. Well, it's a concept that's always been out there and something that should be practiced. ARG integration with the uh, CV battle group supporting the ARG is a very important facet of uh, naval warfare. 
So practicing together actually finally makes sense, and it's good to see. Training the ARG and carrier battle group together means some jobs have become more challenging. There are more shifts to keep track of. Right now, we right now my guys just reported ready bag I. Right now, my guys just reported ready bag. Uh, what that means is they're ready and standing by for the next signal, which they in turn will relay to the uh, the Mount Vernon and the other ships astern of us. So I put the uh, Mount Vernon and the uh, Comstock. We're steaming in a, in a formation, and we're just doing leapfrogs, sort of preparing for uh, deployment. This is the kind of formations we do when we're overseas, like in the Gulf. Getting ready for deployment is also a priority for the Marines. Hanging. They'll reply with hanging to let me know and the gun line know that the round is hanging. So what the Marines are doing right now, or at least my objectives are for the, uh, for the MU, is to refine our uh, planning process refine our standing operating procedures. It gets us used to being out at sea because we're fixing to go on Westpac. So kind of gets us used to being at sea, the routine of things. Marines help out in other areas as well. Staff Sergeant Darren Miller collects weather information, a job he usually does on land. At Yuma, we're out in the middle of the desert and here on ship, we have to give a sea forecast, which we're not used to, the wave direction and height and trying not to get seasick. It's this intense underway training where sailors and Marines learn a lot. We have designed a scenario which we uh, base on, on real situations that they, everyone will have to face. Uh, it's a, in a scenario that will hope, hope for scenarios that will help them no matter where they might go and prepare them for any type of, of either combat action or crisis control action or any, uh, anything that might take them into harm's way. Specifically, uh, again, keeping track of everything that the ARG does, they're near land. That means we have to be near land, which means an increased threat to the battle group. We have to pay more attention. Uh, I equate it to uh, school sometimes. If, uh, if you do really well and, and you study hard, uh, some kids can skip a grade and you press on. And it's in that sense that we've, uh, we've looked at our training strategy. And it's this line of thinking that makes training smarter for the sailors and Marines. Petty Officer Diane Jacobs, off the coast of Southern California. You know, Chris, it's this kind of training that definitely prepares sailors and Marines for real-world operations. And for a long time, women have been part of those operations. During our nation's history, more than one million women have served in the armed forces. WIMSA, better known as Women in Military Service for America, is building a memorial honoring all women who have served their country. But they need your help to make it happen. You have 80 women, 80 nurses, were held prisoner of war by the Japanese. And this was whittled for her while she was in camp by an Englishman. And she kept it with her since then, and she sent it to us. This clothespin is just one of many artifacts needed to create the exhibit gallery of the Women's Memorial. But it's not enough. Wimsa is still searching for artifacts to fill the 14 exhibit halls of the memorial. We're looking for small things and big things. We're looking for things that show something about what you did, what you experienced, you know, what you wore. So all those things are important to us, scrapbooks, journals, diaries, letters home, all are things that can be submitted to the memorial. Some of the artifacts needed are medals, insignias, photographs, diaries, military issue personal items, and uniforms from all times, even ones worn today. <laughs> we get things as good as combat boots. <laughs> it's important because never in the history of the United States have we really captured what women have done for the country, in particularly with respect to the defense of the nation, uh, or in, going back to the American Revolution, in making this possible for the, there to be a nation. The memorial is being built at Arlington Cemetery. It will have a computerized register listing names, service, and records of each woman. It will also have 14 display halls and an education center that brings to life women's contributions. I want them to feel a tremendous sense of pride and to feel that they have finally been recognized for what they did when they served in the military. If you have items to donate to the Women's Memorial, send them to this address, Women in Military Service Memorial, 5510 Columbia Pike, Suite 302, Arlington, Virginia, 22204. And if you'd like to register yourself or someone you know by computer, call 1-800-222-2222.
2294. Sounds like a great opportunity to honor history. It sure does, and that's something Marines are also doing. 50 years ago, 26 days of bitter fighting marked the Battle of Iwo Jima. The remarkable courage shown by Marines in this gut-wrenching battle, along with the stirring image of the American flag being raised atop Mount Suribachi, have never been forgotten. A group of Marines recently honored that memory when they offered their own special tribute. Lance Corporal Candy Osborne reports. As a Marine, it's truly an enlightening experience to visit Iwo Jima and see firsthand the battlegrounds where so many Marines and Japanese soldiers fought so bravely. So, to be invited to re-enlist on top of Mount Suribachi, the very place where Old Glory was raised to begin with, surely is nothing less than exhilarating. I want to do something different rather than just the regular old stand in front of the battalion and uh, re-enlist, be a part of history. Before the re-enlistment, Marines were given a tour exploring caves, pillboxes, and other historic sites scattered across the island. By the end of the day, nearly 50 Marines re-enlisted on Mount Suribachi, an emotional moment for all. Uh, Manila John Bazalo, who won his Medal of Honor in Guadalcanal as a sergeant, died right down here 50 years ago today. Private John Rule threw himself on a grenade right where this formation stands 50 years ago today to save his fellow Marines. <laughs> today, both the American and Japanese flags are flown together. Ironic and unimaginable considering what took place just 50 years ago. That's interesting, you know, because you look back at the war, you know, back in World War II, they fought against each other, but now 50 years later, they're working together, and it came a long way. For Navy Marine Corps News, I'm Lance Corporal Candy Osborne, Iwo Jima. And when we come back, we'll show you how the Navy is helping to build a winning team for America's Cup. And it's March Madness time again. We'll get the fleet's input on their picks for this year's NCAA College Basketball Tournament. Stay with us. If you ever think you're not tall enough or tough enough, pretty enough or smart enough, or you don't want to try something because you feel you'll look awkward. If you think you'll never learn it or play it or figure it out, or you feel unsure because you're not quite the same, well, everyone gets these feelings. But if you believe them, you're selling yourself short, way short. A message from the U.S. Navy, where we believe the only way to grow is to rise to the challenge. Welcome back. The NCAA tournament is in full swing, and that means March Madness has hit the fleet. 64 teams will battle until only four remain, and those final four teams will see who's number one in Seattle, Washington on April 3rd. Petty Officer Mark Kane tells us which teams the fleet is rooting for on the road to the final four. March Madness. Madness, Madness, Madness. Sealers and Marines everywhere are going mad over the 64 college teams that have advanced to the 1995 NCAA championship. This year's number one seeds are Wake Forest. First game is what he said to his teammates. Children, five of six from downtown. Kansas. And here comes Kansas. Bond. Four seconds left. Bond for three and a tie. Kentucky. Here comes one. There goes one. And UCLA. UCLA has beaten every school on its schedule, taking special care to avenge its only two losses. But no one truly knows what four teams are actually going to the Final Four in Seattle. And no matter how good the Final Four teams are, even they know that there can be only one. Arkansas's number one, number one, one, baby. We're going to be in Seattle. North Carolina, that's right. North Carolina Tar Heels, that's going to take it all. Georgetown all the way. Go, 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 Hoyas. Yeah, baby! We got the best team in the country, baby, UCLA! Yeah, baby, Michigan number one! You know, Kansas University, number one, all the way. University of Massachusetts, number one. They're gonna take it all, baby. North Carolina, who else? Cavaliers all the way, baby! Virginia Cavaliers all the way! Yeah, final four, here we come! UCLA gonna win, ain't no doubts, everybody knows that. We got the best team in the nation, number one. Oh yeah, baby. All right, ODU's gonna win, number one, yeah! No matter who ends up in the final four on April 3rd, 
The madness to get there should be awesome, baby. For Navy Marine Corps News, I'm Petty Officer Mark Kane. Clint, when I was overseas, the Marines used to go absolutely nuts when March Madness time came around. They sure did, and they're going to have plenty of opportunities to catch the action. AFRTS radio and television will provide a full slate of hoops action to both fleet and overseas sailors and Marines. And if you're aboard ship, you won't be left out in the cold. Naval Media Center duplicating facilities in Siganella, Sicily, Bahrain, Yokosuka, Japan, and Diego Garcia will be sending videotapes of the games to deployed units as soon as they're over. So Clint, who are you rooting for? I'd like to see the University of Kentucky take it to number one. No way. MU's going to go all the way. Well, too bad none of the games are going to be in San Diego or else we'd both have a place to stay. When Navy and Marine Corps families transfer from one duty station to another, it's always a challenge to find temporary lodging that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Petty Officer Diane Jacobs in San Diego explains how you can find low-cost lodging at Navy bases around the world. This is home for the Doble family, at least for the last few days in the San Diego area. With its large beds, television, and fully equipped kitchenette, this room looks like what you'd expect at a pricey hotel. Old refrigerator, I mean, a little bit of, you know, a little bit of everything. But actually, it belongs to the Navy. It's the Navy Lodge at Naval Air Station, North Island. There's a lot of different hotels in different areas that we could have stayed at but this place here is right on the beach it's an optimal location it's quiet um, it's out of the way the navy has close to 40 lodges throughout the united states and a few overseas to add to the quality of life for sailors many of these are getting facelifts including the navy lodge at naval station san diego which recently opened up 100 new rooms we, we just wanted to update our lodges uh, a lot of the lodges have not been renovated uh, in quite a while, and it was just time that uh, we came in and, and gave it more of a, uh, um, I can say, a little classier look. This added comfort isn't going to cost you more either. Navy lodges are cheaper than comparable hotels, sometimes up to one half the cost of hotels just down the street. And there is no sales tax included in that, or there are no additional charges for additional adults. So that beats the prices on the outside. An added bonus of staying at a Navy Lodge is the friendly atmosphere. Everybody is really nice to us. Um, the, you know, the hotel services are, are first rate, just like any other place that you'd stay. You have a great playground for the kids to play around in. Uh, we get to know a lot of them on a first name basis. Uh, and it, again, it goes back to the, the, the family uh, environment type setting here. Many employees are also Navy family members and are a big help to families new to the area. Because we have sponsored people before. We go ahead and we give them the information around here that we are aware of as of the Family Service Center, which can help out a lot. Um, certain things that we know from knowing our own spouses be in active duty. While the Navy Lodge may not be home, it does offer military members and their families a comfortable alternative. Petty Officer Diane Jacobs, San Diego. The America's Cup is the most prestigious sailing race in the world. Two sailors in San Diego are lucky enough to be part of the action, and if all goes well, they might even help keep the cup in the United States. Petty Officer Ron Flanders tells us more. It's early morning on a non-race day for the crew of Stars and Stripes. But Ensign Brad Rohde isn't taking the day off. As part of the Navy sports program, he's the starboard tailor for Dennis Connard's famed boat. And cleaning the boat's keel might just give Stars and Stripes the advantage it needs to win races and keep the America's Cup here in the States. During races, Ensign Rohde has a critical job on the boat. The sail trimmers like kind of like a throttle man in a boat or uh, let's say a race car, there happens to be two people in one for some reason, he uh, determines the speed of the boat and on a sailboat it's the sail and shaping that is uh, the main ingredient to making the boat go fast. Stars and Stripes definitely goes fast, but the reason why doesn't all have to do with the crew on board during the race. Lieutenant Junior Grade Will Graves does a lot of tasks, such as preparing this sail that racing fans will never see, but that are important just the same. Everybody thinks of you know, the glitter and the glamour of the America's Cup, but there is so much, you know, grunge work uh, going on here, and you know, it's, it's really, it's a lot more than people ever think of what goes on here, and I'm just glad to really be a part of it. Uh, Will Graves has done a good job in our support team, and he uh, has a critical role out before the start in studying the wind so that we can help from a tactical standpoint uh, decide where to go uh, out on the race course and 
of course, uh, there's a number of jobs that are, are not always the uh, fun things to do, and he has a great attitude, always uh, willing to pitch in and do more than his, his fair share, and we feel very, very fortunate to have uh, Will involved in our program. Both Lieutenant J.G. Graves and Ensign Rohde were all American sailors at Annapolis, but working and sailing with the best sailing crew in the United States has really had a positive effect on them. It's interesting being a freshman again, just like you are when you're an ensign and you enter the Navy. Uh, here, you know, you're seeing the other side of the coin, you know, when you're an officer on a ship. You're, you know, you don't always get the, the perspective of some of the junior people. And here, being one of the junior people, you really see it. And, you know, there's a lot of leadership lessons here. This isn't the first instance that the Navy has provided world-class sailors to help win the America's Cup. Well, the Navy has a uh, big tradition, of course, involved with the America's Cup. When I first started in 1974, we had two graduates from the Academy aboard Courageous. And we were successful then, and we certainly uh, do appreciate all the help and support of the uh, United States Navy, and in particular, uh, the uh, couple of graduates from Annapolis. With plenty of high-tech boats and well-trained crews competing this year, the quest for the America's Cup is as intense as ever. And with a couple of the Navy's finest lending a helping hand, Stars and Stripes figures to be right in the thick of things again in 95. Petty Officer Ron Flanders, San Diego. Could you imagine that, Clint? The America's Cup. What glory. That's true, but there is more work there than meets the eye. Well, that's our show for this week. I'm Clint Robertson. And I'm Christiana Halsey. Next week, we'll go out to 29 Palms, California, where actor Tim Allen visited troops and filmed an episode of Home Improvement. Er, er, er. And the Blue Angels take to the skies and start the 1995 air show season. We hope you'll join us for those stories and more. And we'd like to thank those of you who have called our feedback line with comments and suggestions. Please keep all your calls coming. We listen to every one of them. We'll leave you this week with a preview to March Madness, edited by Petty Officer John Charlton. Have a great week.